Hey, so it's our last week. You've almost made it. You can see there's a difference in um, location because my laptop battery is not working so great. So I'm not moving it very much. I'm leaving it in one place so it can stay plugged in. Um, so for our last week, we're talking about care ethics, which is pretty new. Virtue ethics goes back 2,400 years. Most of the others come from the 1700s or 1800s. Virtue ethics are, is the oldest, and then Kantianism, and then utilitarianism. The care ethics starts in the 1980s um, with a woman named Carol Gilligan. So Gilligan worked at Harvard as a research assistant for Lawrence Kohlberg, a psychologist who his psychological research was about moral development. So he thought, hey, why don't we take the tools of psychology and study how people become good or how they learn how to think about morality, how they develop into a moral person. So he did this series of experiments. It was, it was really cool. He followed the same people for years, did a longitudinal study uh, gauging their morality, stuff like that, um, from when they were kids to when they were older. And he would do things like he'd give them a, a test, like he'd pose a moral dilemma for them and say, what's the right thing to do here? Like, a man named Hines has a wife who's very sick, and this other guy has medicine that could cure her, but he's charging too much and he won't lower his price. Should Hines steal the medicine to save his wife's life? And if you said something like, oh, well, you know, my parents would say you should do this, you'd get a lower score. And if you said something like, well, it's about balancing property rights versus the right to life, yada, yada, then you'd get a higher score because you were more morally developed, Kohlberg thought. You were showing that you understood what was really going on. You weren't just repeating what you had been taught by other people. Um, but there was sort of a strange result. Whenever Kohlberg administered these tests, boys would score higher than girls. And Kohlberg, not being gross, did not think that this meant boys were smarter than girls or morally superior. He did think that it had to do with opportunities in education and things like that. Um, but Carol Gilligan, at the time, was working at Harvard with Lawrence Kohlberg and was also uh, living in this community, this neighborhood where most of the people she interacted with were moms and daughters, like women who had immigrated there uh, in the service professions and stuff. And there was this disconnect in her mind between what the psychology results were saying about women and the women she actually knew and how mature they were and the kind of decisions they were making. So she said, something's gone wrong here. Something's wrong with the psychology test. And she thought about it and she realized, well, the psychology test is measuring specific things like how independent do you think of yourself? How much do you care about rights specifically? Um, like how much do you think that morality is about? I have a right to this. Other people can't interfere with it, and then I can't interfere with other people's rights. And Carol Gilligan thought, well, that's not really just how morally developed you are. That's a specific morality. And maybe there's more than one. Maybe women have a different moral perspective a lot of the time than men do because of how they're taught by society, because of the kind of lives they live and the kind of things they have to do. So women, you know, are often the people who raise children. They're often the people who do certain kinds of professions like nursing, housework, that kind of stuff. Carol Gilligan thought maybe because of the way society puts us in different roles, maybe that gives us insight into different parts of morality. And so she came up with this idea, what Kohlberg is measuring, she called the ethics of justice. The ethics of justice are what are your rights? What are people not allowed to interfere with or take away from you? How are you an independent, autonomous agent? Kind of like a Kantian thing, right? Um, 
And she contrasted the ethics of justice with the ethics of care. She said the ethics of care is where um, you think about your responsibilities to other people that you're connected to. You think in terms of who am I related to, not who am I independent from. So like, you know, you think, well, I have a family and I have to take care of them in certain ways. Um, and I have friends that I'm really close to and they need some things from me. And you think about that instead of stuff like, does my right to property outweigh this person's right to life or whatever? Right? Care ethics was supposed to focus a lot more on need. What do people need? How can we get it to them? Not what do people have a right to do on their own? Um, she also thought that meant, well, justice ethics focuses a lot on sort of rationality and balancing different people's competing claims. She thought care ethics focused more on certain kinds of emotion, like concern, compassion, empathy, feeling connected to other people. So she contrasted these two perspectives. Justice ethics focuses on rights, rationality, the individual. Care ethics focuses on responsibilities, needs, concern, relationships. And philosophers took this and kind of ran with it um, and said, well, one thing that Gilligan is saying is that in care ethics, relationships have non-instrumental value. So you remember non-instrumental value means value for its own sake, not just for the sake of something you get out of it, right? Um, so rather than just saying, oh, people have non-instrumental value, a lot of people in care ethics think relationships themselves are valuable for their own sakes. A lot of times you want to maintain a relationship not because you're important and the other person is important, although you are, but because the way the two of you are connected is also important for its own sake. Valuable for its own sake, it has non-instrumental value. Um, why did they think this? Well, one reason that they think relationships have non-instrumental value is um, that we're not actually as isolated as people think, right? Um, it's not the case that I'm just my own little person walking around and I can relate to whoever I want, however I want. Rather, part of who I am is my relationships, right? I'm deeply formed by my relationship to my parents, my relationship to my siblings, later my friendships, so you really can't divide, oh, this is me and I'm the important part, and then these relationships are outside of me and they're not as important. Rather, a part of who you are is how you relate to other people. That's literally a part of yourself, some care ethics people think. So that means relationships are valuable for their own sake to the extent that they're part of who you are, that they make you who you are, right? Um, so to recap, in care ethics, you're supposed to focus on responsibilities, how you can meet people's needs. Um, you're supposed to think, well, maybe emotions like concern and compassion are just as useful in deciding what to do as rationality. And you're supposed to think relationships are valuable for their own sake because they are a part of who you are. That's kind of the outline of care ethics. Um, and I've said I'll give you a problem with each of the theories, like one big problem that it's had a really hard time meeting. A big problem with care ethics is that if relationships that you're in and that make you who you are are valuable for their own sake, uh, a lot of care ethics people say, well, you should be allowed to prioritize that. So if you think about, you think back to utilitarianism, right? Utilitarianism says um, everybody counts the same, everybody's interests count the same. You can't pick and choose favorites. And there was some good reason for that because they wanted people to be equal and stuff. But what does that mean? Well, John Stuart Mill 
famously said, um, if your wife is drowning and a stranger is drowning, you have no reason to save your wife instead of the stranger. They count for the same. Their happiness matters just as much. There's no rational basis for picking one or the other. And Karethix thinks that just can't be right. That's just got to be wrong. Um, so they say, no, you're allowed to prioritize these special relationships that you have with people who are important to you because the relationships are valuable for their own sake above and beyond how the individuals are valuable as equal individuals. Um, so some people think that's nice. You get to prioritize relationships that matter so you don't have to spend like all your time giving money to Oxfam or volunteering at the soup kitchen or the co-op or whatever. You can have some time like for your kids, for your significant other or whatever, for your friends. But a big problem care ethics has had once they do that is that they have to come up with a reason, well, then why should we care about people we don't know? If relationships are so important and we should pay so much attention to the people who matter to us, that we're connected to, why should we bother with people we're not connected to? Why should we bother helping strangers, even if they, you know, even if their needs are much greater than maybe my friends who are doing fine? What basis does care ethics give us for caring about people we don't know? When I do the next lecture on Anka Gosh, she gives you kind of an answer to that. Um, but it's interesting because she's not a firm care ethicist. She thinks care ethics has useful things that you can apply to ethics, but she's not like a ride or die. This is the theory. If you're like a ride or die, care ethics is the ethical theory, it's really hard to overcome this problem of special relationships. So I'll see you next time for the very final lecture where we'll talk about Anka Geosh. And um, I'm looking forward to it. You're doing a good job.